Uh, where are we going to start? We're going to start back here. Do a little array mesh. Let's see, geometry. No, array mesh. Pause this. Come on, come on. Actually, I wonder if I can just close this. Let's see if that works. All right. So turn array mesh on. And let's go ahead and delete that one. And we're going to go ahead and do array mesh with a repeat. Lock position, lock size, transpose. Hit Y to go into transpose. And we'll go straight up if we can. And that'll be my repeat here just temporarily. Let's see how many I'm going to need here. Let's say repeat of five. That'll work. Make mesh here. Hey, Yarv, thanks for showing up. Let me go ahead and open up some browser windows because I know I'm going to need them. Hey, everybody, thanks for showing up. Uh, Yarp says, Mike, you can't transform multiple tools with the transpose the way you do with the Gizmo 3D. That is correct. It's one of the, the limitations of transpose. However, I would use transpose if I'm going to be doing a, a ray mesh. And I just did duplicates in a ray mesh. I didn't feel like going in there and uh, getting too fancy with it, so I'm just going to kind of go through and just kind of manually go, okay, these are going to go from whatever size I need just with a move brush. Uh, you could have made this into a uh, an insert mesh brush, I suppose. And now what I can do is go in here to auto masking. Let's turn on topological and do that. Hey, everybody. Trying to get her wrapped up. So she's basically in the form refine phase right now. Um, let me go back, hit Y to go back into gizmo mode here. And you know what? On this one here, I don't necessarily need all these polygroups here. So I'm just going to go ahead and do an auto groups here. And that way, when I control click on any of these, it'll go ahead and mask them out. And then I can just manually go through and just kind of click on them and then start rotating them around. And I'm using camera space when I'm snapped to the side. I don't need to worry about it getting too wonky on me. Let's kind of rotate these into place. Um, you know, I, I probably I would have uh, drag this along as a brush, but I have a feeling that getting this to snap and then also going down the middle and getting these things mirrored might be more trouble than it's worth. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on mask by polygroups here. And we'll get these things finagled into place here. I can also hold down uh, Alt and go to Unmesh Center. Let's go ahead and turn off X symmetry here so I can just snap it to the center. And then we'll go ahead and uh, we'll reset that and then manually I can go through here and pivot this. Now some of these I'm going to need to use the bend deformer it looks like. So let's go ahead and hit W and then control click this one. I'm going to go to unmesh mesh center here and reset it and also let's go ahead and say we want to put a bend deformer in here. I'm going to go into s uh, solo mode, hold down alt, I'm just going to position it this way and then I'm going to go into my bend arc and let's see if we can't do a an angle back this way. There we go. So we can kind of just angle these back. If I go out of solo mode, you can see what I'm trying to do, which is just kind of, oops, not go to the gear. There we go. Just kind of use this angle thing to just kind of push these back a little bit. There we go. 
And we'll go ahead and accept that one. Unmask, control to click this one, reset. Let's go to the side here. And I'm just using this to kind of position my overall bend. And then just taking this one and kind of bend it back. That was going to be a nice fall off so I don't have to go in there with my move brush and kind of finagle it too, too much. Except, control click this one. Or I can just mask and invert and then W in the center, reset. That one's about right. And then bend dark. Let's go ahead and just pull that back. There we go. And I can still clean this up. Here. There we go. And one more. Now you can, uh, oh, that reminds me, if you haven't watched the 4R8 videos, I've got those up on my YouTube channel right now. I think they're pretty much done. There's 61 videos, about four hours, almost exactly four hours, about four hours and one minute. And go ahead and actually, I'll just link you the whole thing. So if you go to here, Zebra's 4R8, what's new? There's a bunch of new 4R8 videos in there that I just kind of go through. Hey, Nick, thanks for showing up. Um, those are all the new ZBrush 4R8 videos. Like I said, 61 videos, four hours. Um, and then I'll kind of walk you through all the new features. And there's some really cool ones too, once you get towards the end, they're just kind of miscellaneous stuff like stroke pause and the new Dynamesh groups and stuff. Uh, options that they put in. That's And then some of it's not really new necessarily, but it's also um, just kind of tweaked. You know, they put they put in some new defaults in there. Okay, I think that's good enough. Let's go ahead and accept that one. And then I can go in here with my move brush with mass by polygroups up to 100. Um, I can also use move topological. Let's go and turn X back on. And now I can kind of just finagle these back into place here. And I guess we'll go ahead and detail her out a little bit today. Because like I said, she's in her form refined stage here, so she's no real details going on just yet. Just kind of, you know, big, big blocky forms. Like this thing here is just kind of just sitting there waiting for me to decide uh, how I want this thing to be detailed up. And also all this cloth and stuff is just kind of plain Jane. Doesn't really indicate what type of cloth it is. We started a little bit on the glove to go in there and kind of start sculpting a little bit of this stuff out just to kind of, again, indicate the thickness of the materials and stuff. But most for the most part, it's just big, broad shapes with a little bit of piping around the side. So again, these boots are super plain. Maybe we'll start with the boot and like all these little armor pieces here are a little bit uh, plain there. So let's see, let's go into here. Uh, also my smoothing groups, I'm kind of just trying to set those up to get a nice decent fall off. So you'll see like this type of thing is super sharp. So what I'll do is I'll go into my uh, smooth subdivisions. Let's crank that up to three so I get a nice smooth result. And then I'll go in here to the crease level and do two and then D shifty and that'll give me a fall off. It looks a little bit nicer than just the super harsh edges here. So again, and this one, let's see if this one even works because this one's so uh, light on the geo here. Ah, that's not too bad. And this whole this whole lady right here is only about 60 meg. She's very very lightweight as far as just you know plain Jane polygons. Nothing too fancy going on here. Most of the smoothing, the smooth look you're getting is just in dynamic. Uh, subdivisions. Her actual geometry is pretty low, which I like because when I go to go pose her out later on, she's going to be uh, pretty heavy. So I'm going to want to make sure I try and maintain my lower subdivision levels. Um, Yarvas, do you sculpt clothing anymore in ZBrush or just use Marvelous Designer? This type of stuff I'll just do in ZBrush. But yeah, if I was to go in there and give her like a cloak or a t-shirt or you know, tank top or anything like that. I would just do it in Marvelous, probably. Uh, but this type of stuff, and especially like gloves, I've never gotten 
I've tried doing gloves in Marvel's Designer a couple different times, and each time it's always been... Usually I, have to, I end up having to work at a larger scale than I would think. Like, I'll, I'll have to double the scale just to get it to sim properly. I'm probably not going to the settings correctly, but it's usually more trouble than it's worth. Especially for tight-fitting, like, a tech suit or body suit, like a superhero body suit. I'd probably just go in there and just indicate wrinkles where I want it after I start detailing it up. Um, but, yeah, loose, long, flowing cloth when it comes to, like, my time spent versus quality. <laughs> I'm not... And I, if you're an amazing cloth sculptor, then by all means sculpt your cloth. I am not. I do not claim to be. So, all right, let's see how I want to do this. Um, okay, so speaking of cloth, uh, actually, let's see. Let's go out of mask by polygroups here, and we'll just pull all of these down at once. And let's take this one and see if I can't meld these two a little bit better here. Go back into mask by polygroups, and I just go in here and even these out. And I'm playing it fast and loose with these things. I'm not overly concerned about how well they link up. I think they'll be fine as is. A little better. And then mask my polygroups back up. Eh, let's keep that down. And again, I, like I said before, you can use um, the topological auto masking too here if you'd like. Uh, I just have these split out into separate polygroups. So if you didn't want to lose your polygroups, that's another option you could do. There we go. Uh, question. Uh, if you unwrap a cube that has been creased on a clone, then copy paste the UVs on the original object. Does the creasing stay? Uh, no, my I lose mine too. I I don't. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, I think it's just a just a slight bug. Uh, and then transferring the creases back and forth is uh, eluding me as well. Uh, but you're not the only one. So yeah, if you're on UV Master and you if you don't know what we're talking about, if you use UV Master and then you go and you have a bunch of creases and then you un unwrap it and then you paste it back over. I was having trouble getting those to tra the creases to transfer as well. But usually, uh, lucky, the good thing is, is that creasing is usually pretty pretty quick to get back. What I'll end up doing is going into my crease. Actually, let's show you guys here. Uh, geometry crease, I'll just almost always use this crease tolerance. If I have nice polygroups laid out, I'll do crease polygroup, crease PG. And then uh, I'll also use this crease tolerance and set it somewhere around like 51 and then just do a few little bit of crease cleanup to see where it needs to be creased. And then I'm usually good to go after that. Um, can you show us posing with Gizmo 3D versus Transpose posing? Um, yeah, it should be pretty similar, minus a few things. I think Transpose posings, well, I don't know. They're both pretty good now. So if I go into, let's see, let's go ahead and save this one. Form refined. We're still in the form refined stage. No details yet. And it's going to be harder, not harder, but I'm going to have to decide, okay, since this is, if I hit shift D again, this is just dynamic subdivisions here. So when I go to sculpt this cloth in earnest, it's going to be um, a lot more difficult. So now if I wanted to pose her out, let's say I could do use transpose master. So we can talk about that. Let's go into transpose. Uh, Z plugin, transpose master, and I've got all I've got 70 sub tools right here. None of them named because I don't really care what what they're named because I can just alt click through here and organize them like though, like so. So, uh, and they also have all lower subdivision history. In fact, most of them are low subdivision history. But what we can do is we can go over here to transpose mesh. And then I'll go through all of them. Go to my lowest, and assuming I don't have any weird naming, I probably should have fixed that first or anything else weird going on. It should just spit right out into a uh, transpose mesh. There we go. So here's my low res girl that I can now start posing out. So if I want to pose her out, what I'll usually end up doing, especially the way she's built here, if she was just organic, just like a naked person, it would be easy enough just to go in here and hold down control and just drag along her surface here. But you're going to see uh, it kind of works for her tech suit here. 
And actually, let's hit X to go across X symmetry as well. Um, but as I drag along here, she has so many different sub tools and stuff that it's going to be kind of hard to just control drag. And what I mean by control drag is if you just hold down control and drag, that'll go through and just start masking along the surface. But again, since she has so many parts, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. So what I usually would end up doing in this case is just going in here to mask lasso. And let's grab her at the knee, invert that. And now we can just hold down alt and you can just position this wherever. If you wanted to position this straight out, what I would do is just hold down alt and then hold down shift and that'll constrain your gizmo here. Of course, usually also, you know, holding down alt, just dragging out gives me a pretty good indication. And then I can hold down alt and kind of position this here. And if I want to just move it down the axis as well, I can. And now, I mean, I can go into screen space as well. If I want to just snap to the side and just use a screen space rotate, I can. Uh, but I can also, since I move that pivot straight down the leg-ish, again, just holding down alt to kind of go into snap pivot mode here. Now you can go in here and just use like the rotate on X and then just kind of rotate these around. If you want to soften that transition on the knee, for example, you can just control tap and that'll soften your mask or you can go down here to masking. Here is masking. And then you could go blur mask or sharpen mask, but the hotkeys for that are control tap to blur and then control alt tap to sharpen. So anyway, uh, we'll go back here. And if you don't, if you want the knee just to be like completely masked, unmasked, you can, let me see if I got polygroups here. So it's just one solid polygroup. You know what? Let's just go ahead and grab this one, unmask, and then bring it back. Oops. Let me see. Unmask. Does that unmask everything? It should just unmask that one. Let me see. Unmask this thing. And then control shift tap this one with visibility. Now I guess if I clear my mask, it clears the mask for everything. So let's just go ahead and unmask that. So now when I invert this mask, just by control clicking, now I can just rotate that without deforming the knee pad too much. And then I can just do a little bit of a little more controlled cleanup on that knee pad as opposed to um, doing anything too crazy. So I can go ahead and, I, you know, you don't have to pose across X axis. Obviously, I'm just doing that for demonstration purposes, but we can go ahead and bend this back. And now I can just grab this knee pad by itself. Um, again, if you want to, you can hit W and control tap this and then you can hold down Alt and kind of position this here. And now you can start just manually rotating this around and even go in here with your move brush here and just kind of if you need to fudge it a little with a little bit of move and stretching, even these hard reg hard edge pieces here, sometimes sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do. But that should work. So that type of thing. Uh same thing for the arm, same thing for the fingers and stuff like that. Uh if you wanted to use transpose, and on here it should have oh you know what? I should have run uh, reconstruct subdivision history on these. So you're going to see I didn't reconstruct subdivision history, so there wasn't a low res to go back to. So you're going to see this stuff is really low, and then this stuff is really high. So not ideal, perhaps, but uh, you can still go through here and just, you know, mask out here, invert that mask, and then control tap a couple times to blur, and then use your rotate, hold down alt, and then just position that and just kind of bend this stuff around. Um, you see there's some discrepancy here because this one did have subdivision history and then this one didn't. So those are two very different um, resolutions right there with the geometry. Uh, oh, yeah. So if you have, so I'm using the gizmo to do this. Again, you can control, you control drag down here and just kind of pick your position. And when we go back out of here, I'll go on a, a simpler mesh to kind of demonstrate this better. But if you want to hit Y, that'll go into transpose. So when you hit, we're in W move, so W, E, R. And with the gizmo, this doesn't change doesn't matter if you do move scale and rotate that's going to stay the same uh, however when you go into y which turns that gizmo off now we're in transpose line and now we're back to the you know zebras for our seven and before with the transpose uh, same kind of functionality i can control drag and just go along the surface of my mesh i can control mask this thing control tap to blur that mask i can control tap to invert that mask um, and i can use a transpose line as a bone so i can kind of just click and drag and it'll kind of stick to my underlying mesh here and then you can grab these outer rings to kind of reposition those and so you can uh and if you grab the outer ring on this middle one here you can kind of move these things around here like so and once you get those kind of set then you can go in here and just start rotating now you're going to want to make sure that uh, we're on move now so we're going to go into rotate here and let's see what's going oh do i still have brush that's not good. Yeah, turn mask by polygroups down to zero. There we go. So now we can kind of use just trans the transpose line to kind of 
just move this stuff around. Um, of course, when you're bending stuff, you are probably going to have to do a little bit of cleanup in here. So when you're done bending these things, you can go back in here and kind of, you know, use a move brush or this clay brush or whatever you want to do to kind of just even these things back out. Um, you know, we kind of move her head here. And again, we don't have to do this in symmetry here. So if we just kind of blur that mask out, invert that mask, and we have transpose again. So we just kind of drag uh, this up. You can hold down shift and we can just position this bone here. And it's not a bone necessarily, but we're kind of treating it uh, as bones. Just to kind of find that axe. It's going to go out of X symmetry here. So now we can kind of, oops, hit R to rotate. We can rotate around this one. And then we can kind of just move this down that kind of thing and get those into place. Now, while you're still here, you can go in here and just isolate by these different polygroups that you have. And again, just try and move these things around. Uh, you can grab multiple. So if I want to move this one, invert that and oops, this one here, mask these ones out so they all move together. And then I can just kind of go in here and clean this up with just a little bit like so. And again, be because these things aren't dynamically subdivided, it's kind of hard to tell what they're going to smooth over and what they're not. But let's say that's good. Let's go ahead and go back to this one. We're going to go back to T-Pose. Here's our T-Pose mesh. We're going to transfer our T-Pose mesh to back to the subtools. So let's go ahead and do that. And that's going to take all of my pieces and go through and take the lowest subdivision history and then go ahead and snap those into position. So while that's going, go ahead and let that go. Okay, let's see. Um, Uh, I mean, the initial cube has been creased as well. Yeah, I can't transfer creasing using uh, copy UVs at all. I can't get that to work. Um, with Marvel's Enter, does it create automatic physics on the objects, so or what I need to do that manually? It automatically does it. Usually you have, uh, you just import something. In fact, hey, you want more information on that? I have here, go to uh, Marvelous and ZBrush Quick Start. That'll show you how to couple different ways to go back and forth from Marvelous to ZBrush and back again. ZBrush has some really good tools for cleaning up some iffy Marvelous meshes. There we go. So it took 47 seconds and now I have my original lady here with my dynamic, dynamic subdivisions on and if I alt click these ones here you're gonna see if I go under geometry here I just kind of combine all these things together so what I should have done is just had these as separate subtools. So like if I take this one here, actually, let's see if I can go, let's go ahead and split this one out. So I'm going to take this one here, which is just that ring around the, the piping around here. I'm going to go ahead and split that off and I'm going to hit D to dynamically subdivide that. And now if I got this one here, let's go ahead and go through and I'm going to take these ones and go ahead and split those off as well. And then I'll tap here. What else we got left? We got these like little rubber pad things. Let's go ahead and take all these rubber pads here. So we'll go here. Actually, probably be easier just to grab this, 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 and this. Invert that. Control Shift A. There we go. That's a sculpted detail. And we'll go ahead and split that off. And now let's see if we can reconstruct. Yes, we can. So we'll just reconstruct that down. So now we have a low res here. If I go out of uh, solo mode here, now we have these ones sitting here, which do these have subdivision history? No, these don't. And then these are just meshes kind of sitting up here. If I want to kind of refine these a little bit, I could just go through and be like, okay, you guys, you're in your own group. And then you guys, you're in your own group. There we go. And now those are all split out. This one has subdivision history now. And then uh, we'll just tap X to go across X symmetry when we're working on this stuff here. Come on, tap it, tap it. Alt tap. There we go. Uh, still trying to figure out how cinematic teams animate the cloth, though. Though, do they rig it or something? That cinematic teams would have uh, dynamic cloth going through. So when you're animating an object, you're re you're you're pre-rendering, uh, but you're going to have the cloth physics interacting with the object while it's animating. So it's kind of like 
having Marvelous Designer being rendered while your stuff's animating through. And you can actually do that in Marvelous Designer too. You can, um, oh man, I wish I had it. Uh, I took one of my avatars for my commander, the guy with the gun arm, and I had him walking using their, they kind of have a, a walkway animation. So I kind of rigged him up to kind of walk through and then he had his cloth kind of sending as well. Cool. Um, okay, uh, what do you think of Marmor Set Toolbag 3? It's pretty cool. Not too shabby at what it does. Does Decimation Master retain polygrouping? Um, I think it can do poly paint. Oh, you know what? There might be a polygroup option. Let's look into that. Oh, also, before I get too far, let me go ahead and demonstrate on something a little bit more easy. Let's go into Tools here. And we'll take Nick Zuccarello's Humanoid here. And if you're going to be transposing this guy, I'm going to go ahead and have him select. I'm going to do delete other in my sub tools here. And we're also going to go down to our layers because he's got some layers on here that are useful for sure. So if you go into layers here, you're going to see we have an arms up that we can turn on or an arms to side and a mouth open. And you can use these sliders to kind of go back and forth or a thunder crank or over crank if you want to. Uh, we'll go ahead and take this. We'll go ahead and bake all those layers. So now, uh, just like I was doing before, if I hit W, we are in uh, trans. I have transpose turned on. So if I hold down Control, you can just kind of drag down your mesh, and then you can kind of position these things. And then uh, now this is on move, so I'm going to hit R to go into rotate, and then we can rotate around. If you're going to use your gizmo, so if I hit W here and I hit Y to toggle the gizmo on, I can still hold down Control and just drag down my object, and then I can Alt tap, you know, wherever I want this to go. Alt rotate this uh, pivot direction, and I can kind of you know set this right in here. I can use the green rotate Y to kind of rotate these things around if I want to. Um, also, you can just go in here with your mask lasso, like I was talking about. Why is mask lasso not set to lasso? There we go. Go in here with mask lasso, invert that. If you want a slightly harsher fall off, sometimes I use mask lasso like around the fingers and elbows and stuff. And I go in here with rotate and then I can just rotate these things around. Now again, like I said before, you're probably gonna have to go in there with a little bit of cleanup when you rotate this stuff around and just do a little bit of smooth and clay brush just to kind of make you make some of these things pop so if you do have subdivision levels on this guy which you probably would you know you would just go there do his lowest res resolution one and then as you step up in the subdivision history just go in there and sculpt out like what the arm would do when you move your arms forward what the triceps would do what the biceps would do um you know when you bring your arms in like this these are going to flex you can go in here with inflate or your move or whatever and just kind of make these behave as they normally would, just to kind of sell that look. Uh, so yeah, there's that. And what was I talking about before? Um, oh yeah, Decimation Master. So if we decimate this guy, let's go ahead and he's got polygroups. Let's hit Control D here. And let's see, I think if we go in here to Decimation Master, there's Use and Keep Poly Paint, Keep UVs, Freeze Borders, if we go into Preferences, uh, Decimation Master, Uniform Mesh Number of Threads, Save Decimation Master Preferences. Hmm. What you could do, Uniform Mesh, Use and Keep Poly Paint. What you could do is you could transfer your polygroups to Poly Paint. I guess, and then so let's say polygroups. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. I'm sorry, poly paint is what we're looking for here. So not layers. Poly paint from polygroups, and now when I turn off my poly frame here, you're gonna see I have uh, poly paint on there, and then you can tell it, hey, use and keep my poly paint, and you can tell it how to weight the poly paint borders, and then if it keeps your poly paint, you could just transfer that back using polygroups going. Um, from poly paint groups from poly paint there's poly paint tolerance if you need that so you might be able to use that maybe let's see uh use and keep poly paint so we'll pre-process this this isn't something i do that often usually when i decimate i don't care too much about poly groups but it is good if you want to like keep those um poly groups if you wanted to go through and z remesh those later or something um Decimation, so we'll go down here to like 20,000, 20K, hit decimate current. Okay, and it kept my poly paint here, so now if I go over here, poly group 
from poly paint and then turn off my poly paint here and turn on poly frame yeah okay did a pretty good job um, some of these things were pretty similar poly groups here so you're gonna see uh, before we poly group these um, let me see undo 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 I guess those are okay so yeah this one's slightly different let me see if I can just cycle through get these very very much different because yeah if they're if they're close it might not keep it anyway you could you could give that a shot let's see pre-process and then poly groups poly paint from poly oops poly groups from poly paint there we go and now I'll turn this off Like it might need a little bit of finagling for some reason it really wanted to group these so I'm guessing under that tolerance here you'll have to play with because these are these are different colors hmm yeah play with that tolerance and see if that works out for you <laughs> uh, and, and also you if you don't have this many polygroups it's probably a lot easier to wrangle uh, that number of polygroups than a bunch of different ones Uh, you don't use skeleton rigging. I do use skeleton rigging, not in ZBrush, but you can use, uh, well, I mean, you can use transpose rigs. So if we wanted to pose this guy using Z-spheres, what we could do is, and you can save as, so when I go into transpose master here, you're going to see there's a uh, Z-sphere rig that you can bring in. So if you want to use a Z-sphere rig to, to uh, pose this guy, what you can do is, let's see, let's see if I remember how to do this off the top of my head. Um, here, here, here we go. So if I go into my Z sphere here, uh oh, looks like a little bit, a little bit wonky. Go ahead. So what you can do is you can bring in a Z sphere, select your mesh that you want to pose with, and then you can drag out like a Z sphere chain that you can use as bones and use those Z sphere bones to kind of dictate uh, how you want those things to be. Fine, fine, fine. Kill it. There we go. So we can do a little bit of that. Again, if I remember how to do it, <laughs> a lot of this stuff I don't do all the time. I know it's capable. I know that the ZBrush is capable of doing it. I know vaguely what the steps are, but I'm not prepped. I haven't prepped a bunch of stuff to be like, let's talk about this today. And I would go back through and kind of learn it, but it should be pretty easy. So just off the top of my head, let's give it a shot. Go to Nick Z again, drag him out, go to Matt Cap Gray. And if you want more information on like all these custom menus and stuff and you know putting your uh kind of customizing your interface here just keep pointing you back here i mean there, also go to the pixel logic web page as well they have some good stuff also if you want the new zbrush 4r8 videos there there's the zbrush 4r8 what's new playlist so that's 61 videos four hours go in there and it's pretty concise walkthrough i think so let's see delete uh cancel delete other and then we'll go up here to layers and bake them all. And now we wanted to do uh, Z sphere posing. So what I'm going to do is again go out of edit mode, go in here, and let's just grab a Z sphere. Drag that out, hit X to go across X symmetry here. And let's see if I go in here to rigging, I'm going to select my mesh, which is going to be my next Z humanoid. And now I can hit X here scale this down and if we put this kind of in the middle of him here and then we and I'm not going to do a whole mesh here but you certainly could uh, we can go up here and then hit Q you're going to see when I go to the top it's going to snap right down the middle here so we'll just go ahead and snap that down the middle give him a spine and then we'll drag these out now there's a lot of very specific ways of why you might want to place these bones in specific areas. It's kind of like building in the weighting into your, the number of joints that you have. So what you can do in like say Maya is just make a bone system, you know, bones and joints and go in here and paint weights that are, you know, have different values based on where your, um, your bones are with your mesh and stuff. Uh, it can be as easy or as difficult as you want to make that process. It can get very, very complex, or it can be just basic, simple 
bones and then, but and then you need to also have control curves and there's auto riggers and stuff out there but for ZBrush it's a lot simpler you can just go through here you just kind of put your bones where you want them like so and then um, if we do bind mesh now when we go in here and we start rotating you're gonna see it's gonna rotate my guy underneath so you can use this type of thing to go through here and just make uh, bone system. Now you're going to see when I raise this, that's probably not the intended uh, effect here. So we go out of bind mesh here. We'll go into Q and we'll just draw out, you know, because there's no Z spheres affecting these meshes up here. These, it's saying, well, this mesh has to do something when these things bend. So it's just giving these things control over the head, which is what we don't want because we have nothing up here. So we've got to put something up there in order for ZBrush to go. Oh, okay. So these things will be weighted. So let's go ahead and put a neck in here. And then we'll just go right down the middle here. And I mean, you can put in jaw joints, you can put in uh, rib cage stuff. So again, if you see this, if I go back here to bind mesh, you're going to see, you know, this, the lats kind of come out with it, which isn't too bad. But if you're getting severe distortion in here, you can go in here and put in like little helper joints in here just to kind of, again, give telling ZBrush these Z-spheres are controlling what goes on as far as uh, the weighting goes on the chest. So now when I, oops, I'm out of bind mesh here. Sorry, uh, should have gone out of bind mesh here, but what I can do, let me just rotate these things down. There we go. So now I can do is go into bind mesh here. And now when I rotate, uh, you know, this, these arms won't affect this portion of the chest or anything like that. And now you can see as I raise the arms, it's not affecting the head anymore. So now I can go in here and rotate the head and stuff around. Uh, when I'm ready to go out of here, you know, if I wanted to kind of move these around. And again, you don't have to go in X symmetry. We'll turn X off. You can just step, 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 step. There we go. And you can also um, see. Oh, and I'm also rotating down the joint chain here. If I wanted to do individual joints, I could just select those. So I'm kind of rotating, um, again, down. Just grabbing, you can, you can rotate from a bone and that goes all the way down. You can also rotate just an individual joint here. So now you can like rotate, kind of twist along here. Or you can just grab this and move it. Uh, you can also, like I said, you can move something, but then if you go in here, you can move it this way too. So you gotta be careful. Unless you wanted to do something um, where you like wanna scale, you can also scale down a joint chain or you can scale an individual root if you wanna give them a big hand. Or if you wanna give them a big arm, you just grab the bone and then I'll give up a big arm. Rotate down the joint chain. He can hit W, he can stretch his head out using this kind of stuff. So you just got to be careful. Usually, if you don't want to break that, you'll just use rotates. But you can also go in here with move and get a cool look. And then I think if I go over here to adapt to skin, um, in Zebras 4R8, it turns your adapt to skin into uh, Dynamesh automatically unless you turn the resolution down to zero. And then we'll turn preview on and off. And now we got a regular mesh back. Uh, to do that, just hit A twice. Uh, when you're good to go, hit make adapt to skin. And now you're posed out guy cool cool dude will be this one here that's our z-sphere there's our skin z-sphere so now this guy is just our sculptable little mesh here so you can use z-sphere posing transpose posing gizmo posing transpose master a lot of different ways to kind of move your stuff around um, reconstruct subdivision all it is is for example if i go in here well he has two let me just make some real quick so if I go in here to simple brush here, let me just load up my female here. I think she'll be easy enough to work with. So streaming, ZBrush female, high res. One here. And let's alt tap her face because she has subdivision history. So I go into subtool here and I go into solo mode. You're going to see, uh, if I go down here to geometry, she has four subdivisions. Now, if I'm at the highest and I delete lower, and or I, I combine two different things and I get rid of my subdivision history, all you get to do is hit reconstruct. Then you're going to see, you know, this has no subdivision history. It's just polygons here. If I go to reconstruct, it'll just reconstruct those subdivision history, that subdivision history back until it encounters a try. And then as soon as it encounters a triangle, it goes, hey, it contains triangles. I can't. Uh, so divide back anymore and now you have your subdivision history back um, it's not magic you can 
Um, reconstruct some hidden history on, I mean, this one's easy because I started out with this level and then I subdivide it up and that uses the smoothing, the um, smooth subdivision algorithm. I want to say Catmull Clark, maybe, as it goes through and smooths these objects. Basically, it's taking each, we go down here, it's taking each one of these squares and subdividing it into four quads. And then it keeps doing that. Each one of those gets four. Each one of those gets four. And if I hit delete lower, you're going to see every single one of those went from one big one to four smaller ones to four smaller ones to four smaller ones. So if you're just using that algorithm, it's easy to just go back through and step back through and reconstruct your subdivision level history. Um, however, if you have, let's do this for an example. Let's take cube 3D. And I'm going to go make polymesh 3D. You're going to see this one has triangles right at the top, so I can't just go in here and hit reconstruct. However, if I go to Zeri Mesher, turn that adaptive curve strength down to zero, hit same. Uh, oh, let's also adaptive size, not, not curve strength, adaptive size down to zero. That'll give me nice even quads. And let's go ahead and let's keep those sharp if I can. Let's go ahead and do uh, group by normals, keep groups, move groups. There we go. So now that I've got nice even quads on here, what I might be able to do is go in here um, and I'll reconstruct lower subdivision. So I can't, I can't reconstruct these because it's not reconstructing back to a, I don't have the right number of polygons here because it's going back through actually a better example. Let me do this one. Let's go to tool polysphere. Here we go. So we take this polysphere here. Oh, you know, what's even a better example than that. I mean, this will do it too. Here's a simple one. Let's go in here. Let's grab our plane 3d Go into edit mode, make poly mesh 3D. Now I can with this plane sit here and hit reconstruct and it reconstructs all the way back out to a poly, uh, a, just a single plane. And then if I step back up, it goes all the way back to this one. However, if I delete lower and I hold down control shift and alt and get rid of one row, delete hidden and try and reconstruct, it's gonna go, I can't do it. Now, let's see if I can take a row off of all of these things, all the rest of them here. Let's see if this will do it. There we go. So it'll reconstruct back one, but then it stops because it can't reconstruct, you know, these four into one, these four into one, these four into one, all the way through. It can't do it. However, I bet if I went through here and I went, let's see, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four delete hidden, modify topology, delete hidden, and then I can reconstruct all the way back through to here, and then it stops, because now it can't see how it goes. Well, here's four, and this has to turn into one, and I have leftovers, so I can't do it. So that's all it's doing when we're talking about reconstruction. And generally speaking, you're not going to be doing anything that fancy. There's some fancy stuff you can get into if you, like, make a cape and give it thickness, and you can add edge loops to have it reconstructable. But for the most part, you're just going to be starting with, um, you know, you can reconstruct this one, this polysphere, if we delete higher, well, not delete higher, but you can just reconstruct this back to a cube. So as you're subdividing it up, so if I delete lower, delete higher, and we're going through here, and we're using our clay brush to sculpt here, and then we're hitting Control D to subdivide, Control D to subdivide, get some more uh, resolution on here, Control D to subdivide. So we're just using our subdivisions here, which is using a specific algorithm to divide all of these faces as we go. Subdivide, subdivide, subdivide. And let's see, for whatever reason, you lose your subdivision history here. Delete lower. That's okay because you use that just regular subdivision algorithm here. You can just reconstruct all the way back down to where you started, which in this case is a cube, all the way back out to this head. Hope that makes sense. Uh, hey, Blance, thanks for showing up. Um, uh, again, if I miss your comment through here while I'm explaining stuff, just keep shouting it out. Um, so Dodruku says, you can decimate each polygroup one by one by masking, mask other polygroups and reprocess and decimate switch polygroup repeat. Uh, so instead of doing the poly paint to polygroup and then our polygroup to poly paint and then decimating using your poly paint and then switching that back, um, not sure if you want it to be, I mean, I guess you could freeze. So under the decimation here, if you wanted it to be watertight, you'd probably have to be pretty careful about your borders. You know, if you're decimating 
polygroups that are stuck to each other, like the Nexicarella mesh, and you decimate those down, those edges aren't going to, those verts aren't going to match up again unless you freeze your borders. I wouldn't think, but then by freezing your borders, you're kind of dictating poly count along the border, so that, I don't know, I might give you kind of a weird result, but I'll give that a shot. Uh, let's see what I miss. Oh, uh, can I apply apply two separate subtools for the same polygroup? Can I apply two separate subtools for the same polygroup for ID map? Yeah, of course. So if you go in here to, did I bring in my lady here? Yeah, she is. In fact, I have a really good example of that. Let me just load that up. So I go in here. Let's go to my FPS female. This one's a little heavier than the one than the current TechSuit lady I'm working on, but I have her already broken up into material IDs. So basically, if I go into edit mode here, go out of solo mode and turn on poly paint, you're going to see, and I even grouped all the objects together. So if I go in here, and you don't have to make if you want to paint them all the same color, you don't have to put them in the su same subtool. I just did that for organizational purposes. Um, but if these were all split out, like if I had these straps here, they're all one polygroup, but I could go ahead and just split them into, you know, these could be 50 different subtools here, but they can all have the same color or the same polygroup here. Um, I'll, yeah, although if you wanted to maintain, if you wanted to be very consistent, now, now I think I understand what you're saying. So if you did have... Let's try this. Let's go. Let's go super simple to demonstrate this. So I'm going to grab. Doesn't really matter what kind of primitive you grab because I'm going to go down here to initialize. I'm just going to do a oops, make poly mesh 3D. And now when I do initialize, I can do Q cube. Hit Control W. And then if I hit W here and Control drag this one out, that'll be a copy of it. And now these are both the same poly group in one subtool. However, I can take one little piece of this Control Shift A, Control W, make it a separate poly group. And if I go through here and I select this one and I split it, and then I go here, it's like, okay, this one has a blue polygroup. Incidentally, if you wanted to, you know, let's say this was just, this is a good group by normal. So if you want to, you can go through here and you can hover over a face with your Z modeler brush, BZM, and you can go, okay, polygroup, a single poly. When you tap this one, it's going to do a new polygroup. If you hold down shift, that'll inherit that polygroup. And now you can go through here and tap. You can also do that with your alt painting functionality. So when you hold down alt, you can just paint, right? So let's undo that here. So if I hold down alt and I start painting and then I let go of alt, it's going to just, um, oh, because I hit shift previously, it'll just inherit that. Um, if I hold down alt, start painting and then tap alt, that'll just cycle through new polygroups as I go. And then as I keep painting, it's just going to paint with that polygroup. Um, however, if I start, um, hold down Alt and start painting and let go of Alt, again, it's painting that polygroup. If I want to inherit this one, it's the same thing as if I went in here to polygroup, a single poly, and then hit Shift. Just hold down Alt, start painting, tap Shift. That'll inherit that polygroup, and then you can just start painting that polygroup wherever you'd like. Again, just hold down Alt, let go, and then it'll start painting. So just an easy way to kind of go through and paint or inherit different polygroups. Again, if I go over here and I'm like, oh, you know what? I want to add some of this polygroup here. Hold on, Alt, start, pa start painting, hit Shift, and now you can just start painting that polygroup. So a lot of different ways to do that. However, let's say I want to make this one purple and this subtool purple. So I go here, start, start painting, hold down Shift, and then inherit that purple. And then I'm just going to go through here and paint all that. So that's all purple. Now if I hit Alt and go here and then start painting, I can paint all these purple. Oops. Okay, so we're all polygrouped here, all polygrouped here. However, if I hit merge down, are these all the same still? Same polygroup here. If I go over here to auto masking, mask by polygroups. Okay, it does keep the same polygroup when you merge them back together. It just changes the color. Okay, so yeah, that kind of works. Does that make sense? <laughs> Uh, question from Bland, is there a way to get uh, Ray Mesh to follow a curve brush with 
using a line to path button? Probably. Um, let me see if there's a good example of that. I am by no I, I use array mesh for very, very simple things. I'm I'm by no means an array mesh expert, but if we grab this one here, let's see if we can get it to work. So array mesh here. Let's see, we want to array this thing. And I tend to like transpose just because it makes it a little bit easier for me. I don't have to go in there and like do offsets. I can just go in here and just grab um, offsets here, W. Let's see. There we go. So here's here's where I can set my offset here. Like so. And then let's go ahead and set the repeats here. And then if I go in here, you can also go in here and rotate. So you can go through here and you can kind of rotate these things. As well as you can set your pivot. So you have this um, this yellow one here. So if we do go into rotate, let's say we want to rotate in the Z amount 360. And now if I grab this pivot here, you can see we can kind of set that pivot to wherever we'd like in any direction that makes sense here. And now we can go through here and set these repeats up. So that'll kind of get you so between your offsets here, because we have transpose turned on, we can use this. Now if we have transpose turned off on here, we can still use transpose, but that's just moving my star around like so. And then of course you can use transpose just to kind of non-uniformly make this thicker or whatever. Um, as far as align to path, stage align to path, change the orientation of all instances that follow the array path. Change it. Oh, okay. You know what? I think this, okay, so let's go in here to light box. I don't think that follows a curve. Uh, if we grab this one here, for example, this is align to path Z. So if we go through here and do I think the path that you have in your array brush or in your array settings, it'll tell it which uh, which to align to. So if I do Y, so that's aligning to the Y. And then this is aligning to the X. So you can kind of see as I turn these on and off, it'll kind of change how this object orients. So it looks like Z is the default and that just kind of takes us all the way back. And if you haven't, if you're new to array mesh, that's uh, really cool. You can go in through here and kind of move the stuff around. Now, if you're moving stuff around and it starts moving, um, if we go in here with our transpose here and start making these things. Oh boy, I need to turn that off. I guess it's not doing too bad of a job. Sometimes you have to hit lock position and lock size, but unfortunately, I think that align to path is just how you know you set up the path using array mesh. It's not necessarily a curve, and then it'll align the object based on whatever your curve is set up in here. Looks like cool. Um, let's see. Go back here. Yeah. So this is 23 million polygons here. It's actually pretty lightweight for <laughs> some of my ZBrush models. Some of them get pretty heavy. Uh, but yeah, just going back to here, this is again just the um, high res broken up with material ID, separate subtools here. You can turn off the poly paint here and you can kind of see what's going on here. So this was, this one's actually a pretty old object here. Let's go ahead and just delete all, clear that out. And while we're doing the demonstration stuff, I can go in here to preferences, quick save, and I can just crank those up. Cool. Hey everybody, thanks for showing up. And in case you're just starting here, um, if you want to see the 4R8 What's New videos, I put those up on Friday. You can check those out and get you running there. So let's go back to here. And let's see, preferences, edit. Uh, I like to turn off a line cursor at a surface here. There we go. And now we can go in and start sculpting this lady, once we're ready to uh, get that going. In fact, let's go to Preferences Initialize here. Let's clear out ZBrush. Streaming, ZBrush Female, high res. There we go. And yeah, she's only 40 meg, this file here. So very, very lightweight file. And she looks super detailed as far as poly count goes, not as far as de actual details go, because we haven't gotten there yet. Because again, we have this dynamic subdivision turned on. So there's not a whole lot of polygons in this scene um, necessarily, so it's pretty lightweight. And then this one here, 
yeah, we need to break these apart and reconstruct them, but we talked about that. Um, there's some form of spline capability in ZBrush, make a curve service similar to the style of existing car or vehicle. Um, the closest thing I can think of to that, I mean, you can certainly make uh, cars in ZBrush, um, but it wouldn't it wouldn't be spline based. The closest thing I can think of is to spline based would be this uh, sweet profile. You can go in here. And in case anybody's new to the primitives, you can just grab this primitive out and go to initialize. And then you have a lot of different options in here, so you can go through here and start moving these kind of spline lines around. Now the, your end result's still going to be polygons, obviously, but you can go through here and kind of change these things. Once you're ready to go, you can hit Make Poly Mesh 3D. And then at this point, you can go in here the Z Modeler brush and just kind of give it some thickness here. And then we can go increase by Poly Group, hit D for Dynamic Subdivisions, and there you go. And then you can go through here and do whatever type of modeling you'd want to do. Q Mesh brush here, or whatever you want to do. You want to go here, 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 here. And then if you want to crease those poly groups, you can do that. And then if you want to kind of, I mean, this these ones I should have inset first. So this one, let's just do it. We'll cover over this one. We'll do inset. Actually, we go front and back here. And the easiest way to do this for me would just be to isolate this outer shell here. So if we grab, let's undo back through here. So order of operations. Grab this one. Delete hidden. Go through here. We'll grab all these ones here. Hover over the space. We've got to inset single poly in this case, and then we can go through here and you can hit delete. Actually, we can just delete polygroup all. There we go. So now we have a little border around there. It should smooth a little bit nicer. And now we can go to Q mesh, polygroup all, or all polygons because I don't want to mess with those polygroups here. Go ahead and flip those. Now we can do, um, let's do a polygroup by normals. That'll kind of give me new polygroups here. Then we can do a crease by polygroup and then hit D for dynamic subdiv. And that'll kind of, let me see. Uh, yeah, and we should, that one would have to be inset as well. So play around with these. If you want to mess with your crease levels as well, thought I'd go ahead and give you some crease levels here. So, you know, creasing or getting these things on a smooth surface to behave correctly is a little bit of a trying process for me. However, with the inclusion of live booleans, you can also sit here and just go, okay, I want to put uh, cubes on here. Let's go ahead and just drop in a cube onto this mesh here. We'll go ahead and split on mass points. And then we'll hit Shift D on this one. Now, if I use this cube to cut into this curved surface, it's going to be a lot easier. And in fact, if I want to, let's go ahead and just do subtool here. And we'll make this a start group. We don't have to if it's just one start group basically, but we'll go ahead and do it just to get in the habit of doing that. We can turn on live boolean now, and now this thing will cut in just fine on my curved surface. In fact, if I want to give this a little bit more bevel on those edges, we can on this one go into our dynamic subdiv, and then instead of doing smooth, if we turn on our polyframe here, you can see it's just averaging all those vertices. We'll turn on Q grid, and now we can just change the coverage on that Q grid. So now we're kind of getting a bevel on those edges, and of course you can put smooth in there with the Q grid here. And now if I hold down control, we can drag out copies of this thing. Or like we were talking about before, we can use our array mesh functionality here. So if I go into array mesh, turn that on, and then W, use transpose, and we'll just drag out where we want that to go. And then we can choose um, our repeats here. So you can kind of go through here. And now if I turn off transpose, I can just move this one down. I'll move them all down. So now we're able to cut through this object and not have to worry about like, well, if you inset it and then smooth it and then it's on a curved surface, so you got to really figure out how that's going to work. Ugh, gross. That's a lot easier. Uh, live Booleans versus poly modeling. How much cleanup would it lead to with live Booleans? Um, yeah, and I mean, you, you, so if we do go here, uh, let's go ahead and do on uh, this object here, let's see, let's see how much, let's see if we can just, I mean, I'd probably just use zero mesher, honestly. So if we go here and we have this object, let's go ahead and set our smooth subdivisions to three, crease levels to two, that's the three and four. So crease level three, smooth of four. So if I do shift D and D, 
I'm going to kind of give my edges a little bit of breathing room here. And then this one's fine. So if I have these two set together, we can go over here to Subtool, Boolean, turn on Dynamic Subdiv, because we are using Dynamic Subdiv. I'll hit uh, Shift D, that's going to turn off our Dynamic Subdiv. And same thing with this one, it's really obvious. Shift D, that's undynamic, there's dynamic. So we want to keep all that stuff here. So we'll go dynamic, hit apply, oops. Dynamic so to make Boolean mesh. And now we've got our union mesh here. So now, and again, it keeps your geometry just as it was. If you did want to go through here and uh, continue sculpting or whatnot, depending on how your surface was set up, it's going to keep that. The only thing that changes is these transition meshes here which it does make new polygroups for us. So on this one, if you wanted to, we could give it a shot. Let's go ahead and hit duplicate here. And I hear different things from different uh, videos that I watch as far as like, should you decimate your mesh before you do zero mesh? Um, I'm not even sure if this thing's symmetrical. Yeah, I think it is. So let's turn symmetry on. So we hit X to go across X symmetry here. And then zero mesh will take that into account. And now if we do uh, keep groups, don't smooth our groups, and we'll do a, a, a target polygon like count of five is fine. Adaptive size, we'll put that down to like 10, and we'll hit zero mesh, and we'll see how this does. So by keeping our groups, it's going to go through and zero mesh all this geometry here. And we'll see the kind of result that gives us. Uh, well, aiming for perfect topology, what is faster. Um, fastest would be for me Ziri Mesh. Uh, you just have to kind of dial in. Let's go into solo mode here. Dial. You'd have to dial in the right settings and the right resolution to kind of avoid. I mean this gets really close. You know instead of me having to go through and manually retopologize all this and get it to smooth correctly. I mean it does a pretty good job. Now if I go to crease polygroup now and hit D you're going to see it's oops, solo mode. There we go. Does a pretty decent job. There's a few little hiccups in here that you could either just clean up manually or just keep playing with those settings here. Um, and also the other cool thing about this is you can go through here and do just some really quick cleanup. Sometimes if you're lucky, you can go over here to our edge loop and you can just do uh, delete loops based on angle threshold. Uh, oh, did I keep that? Don't want subdivisions here. Let's see, delete loops. And uh, that, that deleted some loops I didn't necessarily want. So it saw the soft angle transition between these two and it got rid of them. So you can go through here and delete loops. But in this case, what I would do is just go in through here manually and do uh, insert single edge loop and hold down alt. And then you can kind of just go through here and get rid of any extraneous edge loops here, like these ones, these ones. And that'll kind of even these ones out here. There we go. Just a little bit less geo to work with and it's a little bit cleaner. Now we can hit D. And the other cool thing too is you can, you should be able to go through here because it did kind of build in those edges for you. You can go in here and do like bevel edge loop complete. And now you can kind of bevel these edges here. If you wanted to, it gives you a little bit more control. Or um, you can like insert single edge loop here and then you can bevel this edge loop. And now you can go in here and like Q mesh poly group ball and like Q mesh this back or forward or whatever you want to do to kind of get that kind of look and you can continue sculpting so or continue subdividing uh, you kind of miss out on the non-destructiveness of live boolean but if you know where you're going and has already been approved then at that point you can be a little bit more destructive with how you want to go through and modify your shapes um, how do you reshape parts of this and keep it smooth throughout um, that's the trickier part and that's where zero mesh comes in or just kind of building smartly with a Z modeler just doing basic box modeling there um, and on curved surfaces like I said it's a little bit more trying for me on curved surfaces because you do need to build in these edge rings and then space these verts out perfectly and zero mesher does that for me it does all the heavy lifting so like here's my original mesh here so we don't need that anymore and then zero mesh took care of all the well, you need a, you know, an insert loop around here and an insert loop around here. And then, yeah, these have to be all divided. Now, if you did, since this did come from an original mesh, you can just isolate this top one here. So if, you, if you're if you like, you know what, it kind of hiccuped on here. It didn't do a great job. If it did a great job out here, just isolate this one, delete hidden, and then go through here and do a, an extrude polygroup all. And then we just pull these back. And again, we can just go ahead and flip our normals because it did that. Now we have perfect 
more perfect geometry here. So this is all perfect all the way through. Uh, and the other good thing about duplicating your geometry, again, it's on a curved mesh, so I wouldn't necessarily do this, but you can still go through here. And um, that's the other thing too, is like, yeah, here's the alt painting thing we were doing earlier. So if we wanted, oh, you know what? I want to put in a little, a little red onto here to start alt painting on the red, hit shift. Oops, alt painting on the red, hit shift. Come on, do it. Alt painting on the red. You should be able to hit shift and it should inherit the red and it's not doing it. So let's see this. Let's see poly group, single poly, inherit. Yeah, shift's doing something weird. It's So shift now looks like it's doing what alt is normally doing. So if I tap alt, it's doing it. If I hit shift, or maybe that's me being dumb. Okay. No. Inherit. Inherit. Alt painting. Inherit. So now if I start alt painting and let go, ah, it picks a new one. That's weird. Anyway, we can still easily do this. We can go through here and like grab both of these here. So if we grab a vert on this polygroup, it'll just select that polygroup. If we grab a vert on this polygroup, it'll select just those two. If we grab a vert on all three of these, it'll select all three. So in case you didn't know that, there's that. Hit control W. Now we're on polygroup. Not sure what that was all about. But now we can go through here with this one. Q mesh polygroup all and we just put that back and then smooth divide it. All that good stuff. Now if you start creasing polygroups, that's where you have to worry about like insetting the stuff and get it to smooth correctly. But if you're just getting it to average the vertices, that'll work just fine. Uh zero mesh guidelines also help. Um Yeah, uh, I tend I so when we did this zero mesh, we turned on keep groups, which basically puts a zero mesh guideline along each edge of that group. So in that case, zero mesh guidelines would just be redundant. Um, I tend to use poly groups instead of zero mesh guidelines because I don't like it's just the extra steps to go in and frame your mesh with, you know, if you didn't know this, you could go in here to your poly group here and then you can go in here to stroke under your curve functions here. You could like um, frame your mesh border and now you can use these as zero mesh guides. Uh, but real, like I said before, it's just redundant if you're going to be have a poly group here and a poly group here, and then you go into your zero mesh, uh, zero mesher here, and you say keep groups, and you know by default smooth groups is up by one. If you turn on keep groups, I just turn that down to zero unless you wanted to smooth between your groups. On hard surface stuff, I don't. On organic stuff, I might, and then that way, uh, it's just basically keeping each poly group as a uh, as if you had a curve framed around that. Uh, how do you match scale ZBrush and Maya? Uh, it just does it if you want to get really specific. Like when I import between Maya and ZBrush, it does a pretty good job. It doesn't really throw anything off. But if you wanted to go in here into your export settings here, um, this is this is like any scale it would be doing on top of, if we go here to your geometry size. So uh, by default, just to make everything ZBrush friendly, Usually the XYZ size will be two. And then on your export scale, if you're working in centimeters or millimeters, like a Marvel's Designer, this is probably going to change. So just multiply those two values next to each other on import and export. Um, if you want to get really specific, you can go in over here to the Z plugin. And there is a, and this is ZBrush 4R8. And then you can go over here to Scale Master. And if you click on this little Scale Master here, About Scale Master, that'll walk you through um, tutorials and how it works. I haven't actually used it yet, but it seems pretty cool. Same thing, there's another cool thing in here, ZBrush to Photoshop. You can click this one, and you can use this to kind of stack all of your renders into Photoshop automatically. So used to be when you went to render this thing, we can, and uh, we are gonna get rendering more heavily. I'm, I'm out next week, uh, 4th of July. It's my birthday. I'm turning, uh, let's say I'm turning 21, and I'm going to be out next week. So we're going to get into rendering after that, I think. I'm going to do some heavy rendering stuff. But uh, the basics is if we go over here to render, we can just drop that in here. And now we can go over here to render uh, render pass. So now if I hit BPR render, any of the BPR render settings we have on, which in this case is just um, shadows, it'll capture our depth automatically as well. And then our um, shaded mode here. And it give us a mask. What do we had ambient occlusion turned on? which in this case would just be render properties, just turn on AO, there we go. And now when we hit render, BPR render, and that's BPR render is the best preview render 
that'll go ahead and save these out. So what you used to have to do is just go through here and click and save these things as different render passes. Uh, but now what you can do is you can go over here and you can use the ZBrush to Photoshop with the BPR, Depth Mask, Shadow, Turn Anything of these things on. Again, I haven't done this yet. Um, maybe I'll do it at work today. And then we can kind of see, yeah, and this will just stack it into layers it looks like. And to Photoshop for you, instead of you having to do it manually. Might save you a little bit of time. Uh, Blends asked me, can you share the link to your demo of the curve brushes? I'm trying to make a string of pearls. Uh, yeah, and I can actually do that for you really quickly as well. Um, curve brushes, curve brushes. I do curve brushes a lot. I'm trying to think of the best one. Mm -hmm. uh, curve brushes. Let me see. Well, let me just do it real quick because that, that, that one's uh, a fairly easy one here. So we go here. And if you're just going to start with, you know, whatever shape you want to start with, and this one would be a sphere 3D here, go into edit mode, and then we'll go to initialize. And <clears throat> if you're going to be dragging out tons of these things, you're going to want to make sure it's fairly as low as you can get it uh, while still retaining the information you need. So I'm going to change these to, oops, not coverage and Z size. 360 coverage, thank you. H divides and V divides, we'll turn those back both down to 12 and 12. And then we'll hit make poly mesh 3D. And then, uh, but to orient this the way you want, if you want the poles to face you, you can just select that. Uh, you can hit B, and you can still have all these options down here as far as create insert mesh, or you can go to the brush menu here, and there's a new create menu over here, and you do create insert mesh, new, and then all on this one you'd need to do, it's, it's not anything fancy like tri-curve or anything, it would just be a matter of going into your stroke menu here, and then we'll turn on under curve, curve mode, and that just gives it curve mode here, like so. And then, you know, changing your spacing and stuff would be under the stroke menu. Uh, I think, yeah, curve step. So you, if you crank this down, they'll start overlapping each other. If you crank this up, they'll space each, they'll space out from each other here. So you can just redraw your curve here. So you can kind of use that. And then if you want more uh, fidelity on this curve, what you can do is now that you have this brush, you know, if you hit B, this is no longer an insert mesh brush. It's an insert mesh curve brush because we turned curve mode on. You can turn curve mode on for any brush in ZBrush. Uh, so now at this point, if we go to, let's grab another sphere here, make poly mesh 3D. And then if you wanted to f have this follow a path, you can just use your, like your slice curve brush, for example. And then we'll just do the whole frame mesh border like we did earlier. And because we have a curve here, we could tell zero measure, hey, you know, you don't even have to keep groups. Just use our... Like we were talking about earlier, geometry, Z remesher here. You could say, uh, you know, you've your curve strength turns out to 100, or you could just turn key groups on and skip the whole curve part. Uh, but now what we can do is you can just tap that uh, curve, and then we can make our size bigger or smaller. If you want to embed this some more, that would just be going into your brush depth here. And then you can just drop that, like, say, halfway. Let's say embed of zero here. And now we can just tap that, and that'll just embed halfway. And if you like that, you can go in here. You can just tap away from your mesh, and that'll get rid of the curve. Or you can go to Stroke and delete your curve, and now you can just go Split Mass Points. That's under your Split menu and your Subtools. I'll kind of keep those for you. And now, you know, again, these are pretty low res. If you hit D, that'll give you your dynamic subdivision. So you can still make it look high res as you're kind of working with them, but um, you can don't have to pay the cost up front. So each one of these doesn't have to be 60,000 polygons. It can be 12, but it can still look like 60,000 if you use dynamic subdivisions. So keep your scenes light. Cool. Hey, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> exactly. Fourth of July. No, I'll actually be 36. Womp womp. All right. So let's go ahead and delete this sub tool here. All right, uh, we still have our lady here. Oh, you also might notice I have some smaller icons than usual. If you go up here to Preferences, um, UI, uh, Custom UI, no, it would be Interface. There we go. Uh, you're going to see wide buttons. You can do wide buttons here. That kind of makes buttons wider. <laughs> but then you can do turn that off and that'll keep them small. Uh, that kind of thing you would want to, you could store in your config. So once you turn that off, you could do uh, config, store config, and then every time you start up ZBrush, it'll keep you small icons. Some things don't um, 
do that. So that in that case, you'd want to create like a startup macro, which um, did we go over that? I don't think we went over that, but you could create a startup macro. I actually, there's some stuff I do in my startup. So I have a startup button up here that's just a macro. And a macro is just like recording things like an action script in Photoshop. So I recorded this startup macro. You can throw it into your default startup, but it was doing some weird things because I like to switch out my smooth brushes and turn on back face masking. It was kind of doing some weird stuff to my brushes. So I basically left that off. If I hit this path startup, it'll go through and it changed my document settings here and it changes my smooth brush. And then for under my auto masking setting, you see back face is turned on for like my clay brush and my clay tubes and my trim brush and my H polish brush. So that's another thing you can have it do. You can just have it record all that stuff. So basically what you do, and it also it turns off uh, preferences, edit, align cursor to surface, and it changes my document background so that it compresses a little bit nicer. So all of these things, um, you can save a macro for, and that was in a Facebook thread I was involved in. You can also use startup, Z Startup Master. That's a plugin Joseph Drust wrote. Let me see. And that'll kind of give you a nice, cool walkthrough of if you want to kind of use the Startup Master there. So, however you want to do it, you can do that. Um, okay, so back through here, and again, like I did, if I did want to make this actual geometry here, I have to decide, okay, when I'm sculpting on this thing, if I hit Shift D, uh, this is just dynamic subdivisions. And so now if I want to start sculpting wrinkles and putting buttons on here, if I hit Control D, they'll subdivide, and this is two separate subtools, by the way. So if I go into Polyframe here in Solo, you're going to see that this little strip here, Control Shift A, which is visibility grow all, that's all one separate subtool. I have all of these things together so that I can kind of sculpt them together if if needed. So I can kind of just move them around together. So it's like, oh, this thing's, you know, way out here. So if I was to go in here to topological, for instance, on my move brush, and you don't have to use the move brush to topological, you can go hit uh, B. And I think move topological is in here. So if you want to assign it to a hot key, you can. I don't use it enough to um, warrant that. So I just turn on topological down here when I need it and just turn it on and off. Because I always have my brush menu docked over here. Anyway, if I turn that on, I can still move these independently of each other, but generally speaking, I want to move both of these together. I might, when I start detailing, either choose to hide this and just start sculpting on just this and then um, control shift drag to invert that visibility, or I could split that out and reconstruct. So I haven't quite figured out how I want to do that, as well as these little strips here are all just um, dynamically subdivided here. So if I turn on D, uh, and then on this one here, I would basically go in here and kind of inflate and maybe like put little buttons along here maybe. I don't know how busy I want this to get, so I gotta kind of feel out like, and a lot of that you won't see anyway, so I might just leave these alone and put most of my detail here and just kind of have some port anchors on here with some vague cloth sculpty stuff. Um. Uh, side panels auto hide and shortcut compatible. Um, yeah, these things here. Yeah, you can. You can. Yeah, I wasn't able to assign a hotkey to that. However, there might be a fancy way to script open side. I, you, you can when you go and you create a macro. So when you go up here to macro, and you say new macro, it'll ask you if you want to initialize. But you can record a macro, and then you can try like doing this and see if it gives you a command for that. And then you could store that as a macro and then store a hotkey to that macro that'll open these up. So if it does give you left and right compatibility or you know top and bottom for these things, you could possibly do that. I haven't done it, but that might be something to check out. And yeah, tab. Oh, okay, I got you. Yeah, that would be a cool, cool thing if you wanted to just kind of step into, because yeah, when you hit tab, that goes into like expert mode. Um, but yeah, your panel, your side panels do stay open. So if you wanted to maybe do a shift tab, that's a, I wouldn't be against that. If you wanted to go full screen. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, if there's an Ask ZBrush video on that, check it out. Um, oh, using a macro. Okay, perfect. That's, that's what I would do. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so you can assign a hotkey directly to these, but you could assign a macro to that action and then assign a hotkey to that macro. Cool. So anyway, uh, let's see. So if I got this one here, 
and I want to start sculpting these details here. So I'm just going to say, and these are all nicely divided up, so I don't, I don't have to do a whole lot of work here. So I'm just going to say, if this is smoothing the way I want, and on this thing I do have like smooth subdivisions, let's turn that up to three, and the crease level up to two, and then shift D and D. Uh, this is a little bit too harsh, so I'm going to go back into my crease level of one. There you go. Soften that transition out. And I can subdivide up individually or step by step just by hitting control D, or I can say, you know what, this is creased and subdivided like I how I like. So I can just hit apply and that ap actually applied subdivisions to this. So now it's not fake, it's all real. So now I can go in here to my um, standard brush. And I have backface masking on already with my standard brush because I hit my little path start up here. So of course it dropped my Z intensity down to zero. So I'm gonna have to look into that. There's something weird going on. Let's turn that to like 35. And it's still acting weird. Yeah, I'm gonna have to i I'm gonna have to check that startup macro and see what it's doing. It's doing something weird. So let's go ahead and instead I'm gonna hit reset all brushes and that'll get me back to normal. And now I just turn on backface manually for that and we'll crank this up to like 36. And now we're sculpting like usual. And let's go ahead and hit L to turn on lazy mouse here. By default our lazy radius is set to 30 it looks like, although that's probably not the default anymore. And now I can start sculpting. Um, in fact, you know what, let's turn that the intensity down because I'm sculpting this detail stuff here. And if I want to start lower, I'll just drop my subdivisions down here and I can start just um, kind of indicating uh, where I want my cloth poles to go. So it's like, okay, here it might start compressing on the side or if she's like leaning left or right. There might be more kind of wrinkles happening along here. And if you put a ton of really fine wrinkles all the way through here, it's going to give the illusion that it's a very thin fabric. So I'm, and that's not necessarily what I want in this case. So I'm just going to kind of try and watch that as I go. And I can also put in like little stress anchors in here. So if I do have like a button here and this is also, you know, being pulled down by this thing here. So I can kind of indicate like where the stress in the fabric is coming from and going to. Um, like we mentioned before, you could use Marvel Designer for this type of thing, but it's just more hassle than I think it's worth for this particular garment. Like I said, if it was like a wizard robe or a t-shirt or something like that, I would definitely use it, but, and then remesh it. Um, again, if you're just starting out here, just new, go here and then check out the, the 4R8 new stuff if you want, uh, but also the Marvelous and ZBrush Quick Start, and that'll just kind of pass you back and forth between those two. Could be interesting to you. Um, cool, perfect. All right, so we've got this, and we are sculpting cross X symmetry. Cloth generally isn't symmetrical, but you know what? We're gonna save a little bit of time. So now that I've got that here, we can start subdividing up. And again, because these are all one object now, and I don't have mass white polygroups or to topological on for this brush, I can just sculpt right across these. So that way, you know, if I do want to put in like some wrinkles in here, it'll affect both the piping and the cloth, which generally I do want, although I might split those out later. And also under smooth, let's change that to smooth stronger, but I'm going to crank that Z intensity way down. So as I'm smoothing, uh, I'm not destroying anything I don't want uh, not smooth. All right, so going through here, we'll just kind of sculpt this up here. And you can go in here with like, say, your Damien standard brush as well, and you can just go through here and start cutting in lines. Although I'd probably wait for the resolution to get a little bit higher. And also, the whole point of me putting these kind of padding along here is to not get it too busy. You know, I, I did this because these things are so busy by themselves. I use that to kind of break up the busyness of those underlying things. So I don't want to sit here and make these super busy if I can help it. So I'll probably skip that. But just in case you wanted to, you can certainly do that. We'll pull in from the side here. Let's go back down to three. There we go. And again, if I just want to work on this, I can do control shift and that'll just take that top poly group out. And now I can sculpt. If you wanted all of it, you can do control shift A and that'll bring in the entire piece front and back. And again, because we have back face on, we're not sculpting through. So that's nice. And we can just kind of isolate that and smooth without having to worry about deforming the other piece here if you don't want to. If you did want to, like, you know, you wanted that to kind of bump up as well, then obviously you're going to want both of those back on. Yeah, 
and then you can use the two smoothing algorithms. You can hold down shift and then let go of shift and that'll kind of smooth without kind of averaging the vertices, the entire form. Um, if you don't let go of shift, uh, and when I'm doing this kind of claw stuff, I will tend to just hold down shift and then let go of shift while I'm smoothing. So it'll kind of maintain the form a little bit better. It doesn't start collapsing in on itself. And yeah, we're not getting too detailed just yet. And now at this point I do have to decide, do I actually want to put visible anchors in here? And what I mean by that is if I want to go through here and do like, let's just grab like a cylinder 12 on here. I won't be able to drop it, drag and drop it on here because of subdivision history now. I can just alt tap any other object in my scene. And then I can go through here and I can go with like, okay, put a little anchor here. And let's go back to our gizmo. And if I'm dropping these in, I can go into the depth, like we mentioned before, uh, here. And if I draw this out, Q, there we go. I can say, you know what? Your depth gets to be uh, embedded. Let's put that embedded at zero. And that'll just drop that in there. And then also, if I want to keep them consistent, I can make it my brush size here. So I can hold down Control as I drag it out, and it'll make it my say three, there we go. So if I want these to all be three with that amount of embed, and also, I mean, I can always go through here and change that crease tolerance, so it'll go ahead and crease it for me as well. And it's also inheriting, so this property here is set at crease level two, smooth of three, so it's already giving me a nice bevel on there. But now I can go through there and add these buttons where I want, so if I go down here and hit control, and then go, let's put one here, one here and kind of add those things and then we can control drag and now if I go into solo mode here you can see okay we can isolate this one control shift a and then we can go ahead and split hidden so now these little buttons are on their own sub tool here and then we can go ahead and just run our crease tolerance there there we go like so so that's what I was talking about when I said do I want to put in like little anchors in here and then of course now that I have those do I also want to go in here we'll isolate this one actually let's go up to the little four here and now I can kind of turn on transparency and ghost and I can use like my clay brush or my standard brush to kind of build up a little detail around these so it looks like it's kind of bunching up around these little buttons here. And if these are too far out, if I do, um, let's do Shift D, go into solo mode here. Let's do a quick mirror and well. That's let's say Control W. And let's say I want to control how deep or how much, how far all of these um, pop out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take what's the easiest way to do this. I'm going to hold down Alt and start Alt painting, and then let go of Alt, and I'll just go through and I'll paint all of these top faces the same poly group. Um, you could also go through and do like visibility selection and then hit control W with all of those, but I like painting. So there we go. So now we can do this. If you want to control the depth of the outer part of these things, I can go through here and I can do like a Q mesh polygroup all. And now all of these, if I hold down shift, that'll kind of push it in and out along the surface here. And if I want to get even more fancy, I could go, okay, I want to inset polygroup all region and I can pull this in a couple times and then I can do like Q mesh polygroup all and again I can just hold down shift and just kind of pull that along and keep these things beveled or I can put inset a screw in here and make a new insert mesh brush all that kind of stuff so get as fancy as you want with your insert mesh brushes this is obviously pretty standard just the shape but if you do want a ton of detail in there uh, by all means and I might you know you can always swap those out later with whatever you'd like once you have them drawn in and everything's working the way you want, it's pretty easy to go in there with a new insert mesh brush and then swap them out. I mean, it might be a little bit of manual work. Let's go in here with inflate here. But uh, should be too terrible here. And this is very similar to that other tech lady I showed you. Um, another good thing is I can go in here with my move brush and just kind of move all of these things in along that side. So when I originally bumped these things out it got a little bit heavy on the side here so we can kind of you know what maybe 
Maybe that needs a button there. You can just take one of these things too, and you can like go ahead and just mask, invert that mask, and then control drag off a copy because there's no um, there is no uh, subdivision history on it. So now you can just kind of move these into place. So if you didn't feel like using your insert mesh brush anymore, you can just kind of go through here and kind of position one where you might want it. There we go, good enough. And again, go into our transparency mode with our clay brush or clay buildup or standard brush. Let's turn off our lazy radius here so we can go in with our standard brush and really kind of build up around those. And then go in here to Lazy radius here, smooth. And I guess I forgot to turn back on our preferences, maximum duration. Let's go and crank those up. Just while we're, I mean, you don't, I wouldn't do that if I was working on this for real obviously, but sometimes these files can get a little bit heavy. And now in here, I can go in here. I can also do like indications of like if there's anything underneath this. If I hold on control, let's go into back face here and let's do like if there's something coming through or like a block sitting under here, you could go through here and like just mask out like underlying features here and then go into your uh, gizmo and you can just kind of pop these things out as like an underlying shape if you had something like sitting underneath the surface here. Uh, that is one thing that Marvelous does take into account if you did have something you could stretch fabric over it. Um, you can also just give little little indications like that like there's something kind of sitting underneath there. Um, so you can kind of see we're starting to get some detail in here and eventually what we also could do is UV this and start tiling like a texture through it. Um, and depending on what your end result is going to be, like if it's a 3D print, yeah, you want to do a really heavy embedded applied texture to this as far as like noise master, noise maker. So we go on a surface here, we can turn on noise and do our old handy uh, noise plug here. Let's do our everybody's favorite hex tile. So now if we go in here, uh, we edit this noise. Let's see if we can zoom in on this. Let's frame it. There we go. Now this doesn't have UV, so I'm just gonna have to use 3 days. You see UVs uh, is blocked out, but we're gonna do mix basic noise down to zero. We can change, let's change our strength here. And plug in scale, there we go. And then strength, there we go. Um, so we can start tying this in and then we can do the noise scale up or down. Oh wait, plug in scale, that's what we want. Tile this down and then turn our strength up just a little bit. Now you can hit OK. Now, if we had UVs on this thing, obviously we could alleviate some of that stretching because we'd be our using our UVs. Right now it's just doing a planar projection, so I'm going to have to pick between like front or side. It won't do both. Um, it doesn't have like triplanar or anything built in, but that would be a cool feature to add. Triplanar projection. Let me write that down. Of course, you'd still have to kind of have UVs in a world space map, so I don't know if that that would be any use, but that might be something kind of cool if you could do it on the fly. Uh, but anyway, you can have that noisemaker on there. Now, if you did want to just had kind of have this previewed and you didn't want it on your rubber ring right here, you could just do Control Shift to select the rubber ring, Control Shift A, mask it, invert that mask, and then you can go here to your masking, and you could say keep the mask there, but I just don't want to see it. And now your rubber won't get the the hex tile on there. So. That's the type of thing we could be approaching. And this is just a preview, just to kind of see like, oh, do I like that? Does it too much noise, too little noise? And you don't have to commit. It's just non-destructive. You can just always go in here to your surface noise and turn that off, just a displacement map, like so. Uh, you want to be careful though, is whenever I turn off view mask, I almost always forget there's a mask on there and it does something weird, like I'm trying to move it. And I'm like, why won't you move? And then I forget that I had view mask. Oops, view mask turned off. Oh, come here. Edge of my desk there. Hey, Kenyon, thanks for showing up. Um, let me bump the speed up here. There we go. Um, 
Uh, playlist we're going between Marvelous and ZBrush. Yeah, it's just in that, that one playlist here. Marvelous and ZBrush Quick Start. There. Oh, cool. You already got it. Um, strategy when modeling folds. Ideally, um, <laughs> for me personally, uh, don't model them. Just have something sim it so it looks good. Uh, if you don't have that, it's basically what you want to avoid is like sculpting folds like this. Usually it's straight, curved, you know, straight, curved, straight like this. And you can set up uh, cloth brushes. Again, if I'm doing any kind of hanging cloth, I'm probably not going to be sculpting it. But just in general, good, it really for me, it's good cloth reference. Beats everything. Beats all the techniques in the world. If I need to sculpt a pair of jeans, I'll take a I'll put on a pair of jeans, I'll do a turnaround, and then I'll just sculpt the hell out of those jeans, that kind of thing. Um, and that's that gives me the best results as opposed to... Actually, let's get rid of that one thing we did there. Forgot I put that little cube in there. Don't really need that. Um, that nets me the best results as far, and also having a, a sim, sim do it. So reference is numero uno. And then, I mean, there's some cloth brushes I've used in the past, but most of them are just variations of standard brush, Damien standard brush, just with slight modifications on those. I don't, and in fact, I, don't, I think they're at work. I don't think I even have them here. I don't do a whole lot of cloth sculpting at home, again, if I can help it. And then, yeah, so here, and also just finding, like, where the compression folds would go if they're going to be you know, folding along the side, and also what type of material it is. If you go through here and start sculpting a bunch of like micro uh, detail along here, we can also do that tiling or the drag through detail sculpting on the sides here. Let's go ahead and hit Control D one more time. You can go through and uh, pass. You can uh, you can make a stamp to go through here. You can use your vector displacement maps now with. Uh, cloth, so you can actually go and you can sim cloth and save it as a vector displacement map, or you can sculpt cloth and save it as a vector displacement map, or uh, any number of ways to kind of get uh, cloth stamps going for like detail and stuff. But uh, you can also just make your own. We've gone over that a couple times too, and uh, as far as you know, saving out with the MRGBZ grabber and then just kind of rolling along that kind of detail there as far as like the micro detail stuff, because that stuff can be kind of tedious to sculpt. Like the, the puckering along jean, jeans, for example. Let's go ahead and turn. And let's drop down one. If, and, if, and if cloth is difficult, Getting difficult sculpt. This is why I'm, if I was go sculpting cloth, I don't do it on like a Dynamesh. I would always like get the shape where I want it, and then I would Z remesh it just so I can step back through the subdivision levels. Because getting these things to deform nicely, it's sometimes a lot easier just to go down in subdivision and then use like feather touch to kind of dial in what you want, as opposed to trying to fight the mesh with smooth stronger and stuff like that. So here. You can kind of give the illusion that, you know, this thing right here, let's go up one more. This so right here is kind of stopping uh, the cloth here and it's kind of bolted in and then the cloth is kind of just going around it. And you can make that as strong or as subtle as you want to. Same thing for this one up here. So it kind of look like it's just pulling uh, right on along that surface in that direction here. Because these are both the same object, you can go through here and just, you know, dial in that type of stuff too. If you want to get really, really wrinkly, you can go through there and do that. But this one I think will be a little bit tighter. But I kind of like that idea maybe through here. Again, I don't want to get too noisy on this stuff, even with the fabric detail or 
the sculpt detail here will kind of just indicate, okay, that kind of look here. You can also just kind of bloat this out if you want to kind of make it look like it's not super skin tight, but it does kind of bag in some areas. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't want it to get too dumpy or anything like that. I do want to keep it fairly sci-fi. So let's go ahead and kill that there. That kind of thing. Um, press new macro and nothing happens. That's weird. So let's, I mean, let's do that. Let's, let's make a macro real quick. So we're going to save as ZBrush tech suit form refine. Oh wait. Yeah. No, this is actually getting into now detail. Hey, we're getting into details now. Zero, zero, one. So now let's see if I go here to macro, I'm going to say a uh, new macro. It's going to ask me, do you want to fully initialize ZBrush? Uh, it might be safer, so I'm going to go ahead and hit yes. Um, if you don't, you don't have to. If you don't want to, if it's something simple like just turning something on and off, uh, there we go. So now, you know what? Let's let's give that one thing a shot. So, well, I don't know how deep I want to get into this, but well, we can try it. So, uh, so now that we have that, we have macro, and we have end macro now available to us. So let's see what this does. If we turn this one open and closed, so we can kind of close that and open that. We're going to go to macro end macro and we'll just save this as test and you're going to see it's saving it um, in the streaming zbrush female uh, let's go ahead and throw it into it'll be zbrush for r8 if you want it to show up every time you start up zbrush z startup macros miscellaneous we'll just throw our test uh, right in there and now i'm going to go look at that macro here let's see what it says so again i'm going to go to zbrush for r8 z startup macros, miscellaneous, and now we have test. So the test here is, okay, press divider and click to restore previous position. Show actions, set draw size. So yeah, you can go in here and actually delete stuff. So like, oh, set draw size to 29. That was probably something I was just doing out of habit. Um, Okay, and that just toggles previous position. So if I open and close it, it did it twice. So let's go ahead and save this. And now if we go back in here, we can go. So we've ended that macro, and now we've got macro. If it's not in here, just hit reload all macros. And oh, it should show up in miscellaneous. Z startup macros miscellaneous test. Hmm. Reload. Reload, reload, reload. Hmm. Yeah, it should show up right in there because that's where we saved it, I thought. But yeah, you should be able to see a test button in here. Let's see. Macro and macro. See startup divider left there we go and then macro it's saving it in there but it's not z startup macros miscellaneous i think that's where it ends up going or maybe i'm wrong maybe it goes into give me a second c users public documents z startup i don't think it goes in there ZBrush data, Z startup, no. Weird. Uh, that's weird. But yeah, you should be able to, you know, make a macro. And then once you have a macro made, you should be able to control alt select it. Since it's on startup, it'll show up every time you start up ZBrush. In fact, let's just give that a shot. Just in case it's being weird. Let's restart ZBrush and see what it does. And then you can control alt click your macro and assign it to a hotkey. And then you can have a hotkey that'll sit there and toggle your left divider open and closed. At least how it should work in my brain. We'll see if that's correct though. Yeah, nothing. Macros miscellaneous. Am I putting that in the right thing? Yeah, macros miscellaneous. Test, divider left. Hmm. I don't know. Maybe I busted something. Let's do another one.
can't get him to show up. But I'll have to look into that. That should be that should be something uh, that that's doable. I just don't know why it's not working right now. Hmm. <laughs> um, is there an easy way to make a head scarf for a uh, desert? Yeah, yeah, that's really easy to do. Marvelous. Um, I won't get into. Well, I mean, if you guys want to get into like Ziri mesh, how much time we got left? We can do. We can do that really quickly, and then I can show off. Uh, well, uh, actually, I don't know if I can do it really quickly. Let's see if this behaves, because uh, we can use this to go ahead and do uh, Ziri mesher as well because it makes it so much nicer in ZBrush to do that. So if we go in here, and we do demo head female here, and yeah, I guess that'll work. Okay, so subtool here, and let's go ahead and turn this off, and we'll go ahead and export this to our desktop here, female head. And then, yeah, you can just wrap any sort of cloth. You can export that, rebring it in, do zero mesh, and then you can go use ZBrush. In fact, I don't do any real detailing in Marvelous. It's all just basically giving my primary forms, giving my secondary forms, and then I'll use ZBrush here to do the the heavy lifting. So we'll just go really quickly to import OBJ desktop here and grab our female head. And I'm just going to do an auto scale so that I'll just bring it in uh, roughly the size that I want, and then I can use uh, this gizmo here really quickly. And then if you want to make a scarf, you just go in here, make a new pattern. Whoops. Make a new pattern here. There's my scarf. And then you can rotate this around. And you can go sim it. And I am on my laptop here. Oh, you know what? Yeah, okay, I did bring that in. So in order to get this, and this is a huge scarf, so I'm going to go ahead and turn that off. And we're going to grab this one. We're going to make our particle distance 10. Or I'm not, sorry, 10 is going to make it worse. Let's make it 40. And then you can pin this stuff, you can move it around, whatever you want to do to kind of get this behaving how you want. But once you're good to go, uh, we can, if you do, go in here to your particle distance here, and we'll make this back to 20 here. And that'll go ahead and up your resolution on your mesh. And we'll say, yes, this is fine. Fine, whatever. Export OBJ. Cloth. And then we'll go back into ZBrush here. Import that. There we go. So now, what you have right now, you're going to have two separate objects, and it triangulates everything. So you're going to, I mean, you can do quadrangulate, but it's easier just to use Ziri Mesher. So I'm going to grab this one here. Control Shift. We'll just grab a piece of this one, Control Shift A, and then we'll go ahead and split hidden. And now I've got these two, so I can go ahead and duplicate this one off, and we'll Ziri Mesh this one. So, uh, pretty easy. Now, with Ziri Mesher, I am going to keep my adaptive size up a little bit so I can kind of get a little bit more of these wrinkles and not worry so much about concentric squares or just perfect squares everywhere. So, we can go over here to Ziri Mesher here and let's do target polygon count of uh, five is probably fine. I'm going to keep my adaptive size at like 20 and then we'll do Ziri Mesh. And if we go into solo mode here, you're going to see it's doing an okay job. I think 5 might be a little bit low, or my adaptive size might be a little bit low too. My adaptive size, if I crank that up, it's going to add more polygons than 5K, my 5K target, so I can kind of use that to also dial in resolution. And, oh, do I have X turn on? No, okay. And then also let's try and crank this up to like 8 maybe. Some really weird stretching along there, that front part. Uh, I mean, you can go through here and start projecting this. You can do a subtool project all, which is going to be under your subtool menu here. Uh, but if you did want to give this cloth thickness, um, you know what else might help? Let's go into solo mode. Let's undo that. <clears throat> now that edge is pretty clean. Let's do this. And 
then we can go through here, grab one of these phases, Q mesh. Uh, let's do extrude, and then we can just give this some. Oops, let's extrude all polygons here. And then we'll go ahead and flip those faces here. That's under your, <clears throat> excuse me, your display properties flip. And now we can do this top one here, and we can project all to get our detail back. Although I'm now I'm wondering. Display properties isn't flipped. Okay, so everything's good. This one is still fine. Oh, you know what? Let's turn our head off. We don't want to project to that. So now we can do project all on this one here. This is our Ziri mesh here. There we go. So project all. And then let's go ahead and crease our poly group here. And we'll isolate this one. And now we can do project all and the, you know because we when we sim this thing it was pretty low resolution see how crunchy that is we will end up building that into our projection but it's not a huge deal to clean up so basically we have the detail back to where we want it here so that's just a matter of going through here and kind of smoothing this stuff out and then it also built in the faceting on the top of the head there which isn't again it's not a huge deal so now that you've got your primary and secondary forms you can go through here and start adding uh, more detail. If you did have cloth that you could drag out, um, that can give you um, good, uh, it's called like memory wrinkles. It's basically like if you take a shirt and you wad it up and you let it sit there for a couple days and then you then you fold it out, you're going to have primary big, big wrinkles and then you're going to have like a lot of little little wrinkles in there. You can make brushes for those to kind of drag out. Uh, but you can also go through here and just start punching this up a little bit. So if you have your standard brush with our lazy mouse on here, you can just hold down Alt and let go of alt and you can just kind of start sculpting in a little more detail or you can go super detailed let's go smooth stronger here and uh, you could use again like I said cloth that you kind of drag out on here and kind of do that kind of stuff but like I said for me to sculpt this would take me quite a bit of time uh, but that's something I'm into Okay, cool. So it's restarting ZBrush fixture macro. I still, I still don't know why mine's messing up. I have to look into that. Um, <laughs> oh, Sickle says, I noticed with 4R8, you can restart menus by tapping tab or comma key. Oh, the light box bringing that up. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know why this is, this is being weird. Hmm. Uh, edit the macro and put in I click from notepad then reload ZBrush should give you a button the macro changes click that button yeah that's what I've been doing and I have this thing saved save as it's under Z startup macros miscellaneous it's all in there I saved it making new macros I wonder if I need notepad closed or something I don't know but yeah I can't seem to get them in there Yeah, and you can you can kind of dictate, usually with cloth, like on pants and stuff, it does a pretty stellar job, but you can kind of help it out, again, if you go into like BC, oh, I'm sorry, BZ, Z, Remesher Guides, and you can kind of be like, hey, you know what, uh, let's see, let's do delete lower. So it'd be something like, you know, I want you to follow here and you to follow here. It sh usually does a pretty stellar job of this, but it was getting kind of caught up in something. So you can kind of dictate how you want these guides to go, or whatever. And also, you could do a Z remesh pass, and then uh, we've done this before too. So if you have, um, you can do Z remesh, and then you can throw that into a Z sphere, and then clean it up your near Z spheres, just kind of manually going around and just cleaning up any odd areas you have. Or Z modeler, you can go into Z remesher, and then like start splitting edges and kind of moving those around uh, to get what you want, and then you can start projecting and stuff. And also, before you project, it might be a good idea to go ahead and UV those. Um, you can transfer UVs from because your your marble designer will have UVs it'll just be basically your pattern uh, but transferring those can be a little bit tricky if you don't have like a transfer attributes but you can give that a shot huh I've never had it leave holes it does a pretty good zero measure job and we've done and this is nothing new if you go uh, again to this marvelous ZBrush and back playlist 
it does a pretty stellar job usually. I haven't had too much problems with it. I've used it on almost every character I've done. Minus this techy female because really I don't think I need it for her. <laughs> um, cool. All right. How are we doing, Tom? We got about four minutes left. Uh, probably no, no point in me going too much further with this little lady. Let's see. I have my ZBrush female. So we're gonna. I'm gonna get her kind of cleaned up this week. Again, I'm gone next week, so just uh, keep that in mind. But I'm gonna get her all uh, ready for rendering, and then I think we're gonna go over uh, some rendering stuff. I'll give you more information about that coming up. Preferences, edit, line cursor to surface, and I'll trust. I'll try to figure out why my macros aren't working. But anyways, uh, if there's no more questions, I will bid you guys adieu. And see you next time. Like I said before, uh, I'm gonna be gone next week, but I will, uh, we're gonna get into rendering. I'm gonna try and have this lady done. And really all I'm doing is just going in and like doing this cloth sculpting type of thing just to kind of add, punch up the detail a little bit. And then I'm gonna go through here and do like live Booleans or Z modeler stuff and just kind of start digging in some detail onto this type of armor here. Nothing too fancy. Make these boots <laughs> a little less plain Jane. Make this stuff a little less plain Jane. Again, this is all just little simple things. If I go into solo mode here, you'll see how simple this stuff is. There's nothing to it. So it's just a matter of dynamic turned on and all this stuff. And I don't know, maybe we'll detail this thing up and pop some things in those little holes back there. But for her little spine support and her elbows. And so her armor stuff, I'll detail it up. And then her cloth stuff, I'll have that all separated out. And then we'll get into rendering next time. Not next week, but the week after. And um, we'll be rendering in ZBrush. Uh, we'll, I mean, we can do both. We'll, we'll, we'll render in Keyshot too because there's a lot of cool stuff you can do. Um, but I'm going to be doing some stylized rendering in ZBrush. That'll be really fun, I think. We're going to be using, if you guys want a sneak peek, go to uh, really quick ZBrush. Let me see if I can find it real quick. ZBrush, guys. That's the uh, Pablo Munoz Gomez. Stylized rendering. Um, and I'm, you know, I'll decide if I want to do it on my channel. So on this channel, I do Tuesday mornings. On my channel, I do Thursday mornings. So it might be, I might do my channel first, but you know, if, if they're cool with it, I'll do it here too. And no, there's some pretty cool stuff in here that kind of goes through. And the reason I like it is it goes through and explains, um, it goes through and explains, uh, like how matte cap works and light cap works uh, in a very in a very cool way with a lot of cool objects. So you can check that out. Uh, I'm not going to bother UVing it. It's just going to be high res renders, so we can you know use this and use render this thing to make it look like it's a comic book style rendering. Or go to Keyshot. Keyshot you don't need UVs. You can just do projection mapping and stuff for any detail stuff. So uh, now if we did want to take this into like Engine, take it into Unreal or something, yeah, I'd have to game res it and UV it and stuff. And we I probably won't do that on this channel. I would do any production stuff I would do on my channel just to keep, just because if I'm hopping out of ZBrush all the time, there's no point in me. I, I like to be in ZBrush 99% of the time if I'm, a, if I'm on Pixelogic's channel. So we'll see how far we want to take this thing as far as like game res and stuff. We'll, we'll see how that goes. But anyway, you guys have a good day. I will see you uh, not next week, but the week after.